from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Millicent Walker. Good evening. Tonight, Nigeria remembers her fallen heroes. President Buhari leads other government officials to lay memorial wreaths in their honor amid colorful military display. Families of fallen soldiers and retired military personnel demand better welfare at Armed Forces Remembrance Day. Fourteen persons, including five children, die in ghastly motor accident on Aimba Ajaukuta Expressway in Kogi State. And Uganda's opposition leader Bobby Wine alleges electoral fraud as President Museveni takes early lead in presidential poll. Plus, you see business, sports, and later international news from our London studios. On business news tonight, Nigeria's headline inflation rate climbs further to 15.75% in December 2020, its highest level in nearly three years. On sports news tonight, former Manchester United and England forward Wayne Rooney ends his playing career to become Derby County manager on a full-time basis. And from Abuja, Kaduna State Government rescues 160 Almajiri from Bene Republic, Burkina Faso and 13 other states across the country. Today, we remember our fallen heroes, and as customary, the week-long activity climaxed with memorial celebrations in the nation's capital, Abuja, and across states of the country. President Muhammad Buhari and other key government functionaries joined top military officers to celebrate the Armed Forces Remembrance Day at the National Arcade in Abuja. Our State House correspondent, Kayla Megwa, reports. The First World War ended in 1918, the Second World War in 1945, and Nigeria's Civil War in 1970. This has in no way affected the solemnness of neither this yearly ceremony nor its importance to Nigeria, especially in the wake of several internal and external security challenges. The men and women of the armed forces honored here by President Muhammadu Buhari, who's rarely ever seen in public since the COVID-19 pandemic. The sound of the bugle summons the souls of the country's fallen heroes. Laying wreaths, they are honored by the government and mourned by their loved ones. No speeches are made, no messages of goodwill, no clearing calls. The president signs the yearly register releases the birds, and the armed forces observe the gun salute. <laughs> 2021's Armed Forces Remembrance Day reminds Nigerians of the ultimate sacrifice made by men and women whose only desire was to serve their country, and the plight of those who are still serving. This cenotaph, these wreaths laid here by dignitaries of the Nigerian government in honor of men who have died saving their country. It is the ultimate sacrifice to die for one's country, one that many people will probably not want to make. What's most important here is that those who serve this country and keep us safe are given the best, best possible treatment. That way they can go about their job of keeping us safe as the years go by. Kayla Megwa, Channels Television News. A similar ceremony also held in states across the country where governors joined military officers to lay wreaths in honor of their fallen colleagues. Governors of states plagued with insecurity in the north are pledging their commitment to support security agencies in restoring peace. Borno State has been the worst hit by insecurity in the last decade. The state is still mourning the over 40 rice farmers recently killed by Boko Haram, while honoring soldiers who have died in this war on insurgency at the Ramat Square in the state capital, Maiduguri. Ex-service men here want to be part of the anti-terrorism operations while calling for better welfare. The army or your leader 
don't forget us to now. How many? Almost 50 years. It's no joke. So all of them, half of them don't die. Finish. Because they have a petition. In Katsina State, home to the over 300 recently returned Kankara boys who were abducted from their government secondary school, the celebration was held at the Katsina Military Cenotaph. The deputy governor of the state, Manuri Yakubu, thanked the troops for rescuing the schoolboys and pledged more support from the state. I also wish to acknowledge the contribution of the armed forces during the rescue of the 344 students of the Government Science Secondary School, Kankara, that were kidnapped by armed bandits on, um, from Friday, 11th of December 2020. This feat was made possible by the gallantry and nakedness of the armed forces during the rescue operation. In Kaduna State, Governor Nasser El Rufai, represented by his deputy, Hadiza Balarabe, at the Reed Lane ceremony, commended the contributions of the military to national security. Uh, it is indeed uh, a thing of joy for us to, to be here, and we pray that God in his mercies will continue to give them rest, you know, in our Jannah and that the children that you have left behind, that uh, they'll find solace in the fact that they're not alone, that we are with them. Set! Set! In Yobe, another state rocked by insecurity in the last decades, the event took place at Government House Damaturu, featuring a 21-gun salute by the personnel of 241 Reese Battalion Nguru in honor of the fallen heroes and releasing pigeons to symbolize peace. Governors of Nasarawa, Jigawa, Adamawa and Sokoto states all took part in the Reed Lane ceremonies honoring Nigeria's fallen heroes. The loss of lives in the region, both of servicemen and civilians in northern Nigeria, is a major source of concern. Just a few days ago, five soldiers were killed in Alagarno in Borno State, adding more dead soldiers to the thousands of servicemen who have died protecting their country and untold hardship on their families. And from the north, we move down south, where state governors also pay tribute to gallant officers who lost their lives in the line of duty. They also solicited better welfare for those still in service. It's a solemn parade signifying the presence of the Nigerian Army, Nigerian Air Force, Nigerian Navy, and the Nigerian Legion to commemorate the 2021 Armed Forces Remembrance Day in honor of the nation's fallen heroes. In Lagos State, Governor Babajide Sonwulu makes his way to the Tafawa Balewa Square and in the usual tradition, he lays the wreath, releases the doves and commends military officers for keeping to the tradition of the annual celebration in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're thankful to God that we can still keep this year's activity um, as important as it is. The arcade ground in Abe Okuta, the Ogun State capital, captures the moments, and the deputy governor, Noimot Salako Oyedele, asks Nigerians to embrace peace and unity. We must work together for the continued unity and development of our dear nation. Still in the southwest, in neighboring Oyo State, a call for more support for security agents is the message from the state governor, Shei Makide, who expresses his determination to achieve a safe and secure metropolis for residents. We'll continue to do our best to ensure a safe, secure and stable environment. In the south-south, even as the River State Governor commemorates the Armed Forces Remembrance Day, Governor Yeson Wike is calling for a change of the nation's current service chiefs, a move he believes will end the security challenges in the country. 
We thank the Saudi chiefs for their efforts so far in the battle against the soldiers. But we also align with the concern of citizens that having seemingly reached their wit's end, they should not give way for fresh hands. It was a low-key affair in Delta State where Governor Ifai Okoa leads top military and paramilitary officers to lay wreaths at the statue of the unknown soldier. In Edo State, Governor Godwin Obaseki assures war veterans in the state of a role in the new security architecture which is being put in place to check the spate of crime. The nation appreciates their sacrifice, appreciates their service, and that whatever happens to them in the course of duty, they will never be forgotten. Still in the South-South, where serving and retired officers gather in Akwaibom State to commemorate the day, and Governor Emmanuel wants the soldiers to always be remembered for their service. As he goes straight to the saluting dog. In neighboring Cross River State, Governor Ben Ayadi uses the opportunity to announce the approval of buses to ease the logistics problem of security officers. I understand your challenges, I understand the situation, but on the immediacy, I'm hereby authorizing and approving the procurement and purchase of a brand new bus for all of you, the ex servicemen. In the southeast, the Imo State Governor Hope Uzodima commends the Nigeria Armed Forces for their resilience and patriotism in protecting the territorial integrity of the country. We we'll continue to cooperate with you in the discharge of this your job for the protection, defense, and unity of Nigeria. In the Bakaliki, the Aboyan State Capital, the Deputy Governor performs the wreath laying ceremony. And the Anambra State Governor, Willie Obiano, ensures the ceremony is in full compliance with the COVID-19 protocols. We celebrate the bravery of our officers and men who gave lives and limbs for the good of Nigeria. In Enugu State, it's slightly different as the Governor chooses to spend the day with wives of the fallen heroes and support their welfare. The Armed Forces Remembrance Day honors fallen heroes, men who have paid the supreme price to safeguard the nation's peace, security and stability. It also honors retired and serving officers. The tributes for the fallen heroes have been pouring in from far and wide as Nigerians express gratitude to those who have gallantly put themselves in the line of fire. In this report, our correspondent Orolua Shunibare spotlights a few out of the many that have laid down their lives for the country. Good evening and welcome to the campfire, special campfire. Thank you. In 2016, a certain officer was recognized for acts that earned him the right to be celebrated by his colleagues. Activities, the Chief of Army Staff deem it fit to also decorate Major Abu Ali with the rank of a Lieutenant Colonel. He has done the nation proud. Unfortunately, not long after this campfire celebration, Lieutenant Colonel Abu Ali, along with six other soldiers, were ambushed and killed by Boko Haram. The news of his death was a dark day in the nation's fight against insurgency. However, his legacy lit up dim hearts, so much that members of the House of Representatives requested he receive the posthumous promotion. Having paid the highest price payable in defense of one's nation, the question that has come to haunt us is a befitting way to immortalize such villain. There is also Colonel Dahu Rubako, ambushed by Boko Haram in September of 2020. His death was also described as a setback in the fight against insurgency. Although not killed in battle, 
but for daring to face up to the security challenges and surpassing male counterparts to become Nigeria's first female combat air pilot, Tolula Kwarotile is without doubt worthy of mention. Every year, tributes for them and many other soldiers and officers who gave their all to the cause of defending the nation pour in. A hero is described as a person who is admired for courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. Every combatant who has paid the ultimate price was a friend, brother, sister, father, and mother. To them, Nigerians remain ever grateful. Oralua Shonibare, Channel Television News. In part two, after the break, families of fallen soldiers and retired military men demand better welfare at Armed Forces Remembrance Day will be joined by a retired military officer, Colonel Tony Niam. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Nigeria remembers her fallen heroes. President Buhari leads other government officials to lay memorial wreaths in their honor amid colorful military display. Families of fallen soldiers and retired military men demand better welfare at Armed Forces Remembrance Day. 14 persons, including five children, die in a ghastly motor accident along Gaigba Jaukuta Expressway in Kogi State. And Uganda's opposition leader Bobby Wine alleges electoral fraud as President Museveni takes early lead in presidential poll. An enjoyable retirement is the dream of every Nigerian worker. But for some ex-military men, life after service has not been easy. While some ex-soldiers are calling for prompt payment of all their outstanding benefits, the wives of the fallen heroes are making a passionate appeal to the government to provide them with housing as Nigeria celebrates the Armed Forces Remembrance Day. January 15th each year is set aside by the government to honor its military personnel who died in the line of duty. The day is marked with a colorful ceremony to acknowledge the sacrifices paid to secure the country by those popularly referred to as unknown soldiers. From those who died during the Civil War to those killed by insurgents in the Northeast, as well as those who died fighting banditry in states like Zamfara, Katsina and Sokoto. In the light of the ceremony, the government continues to give assurances of their support for families of the fallen heroes. The wives of the fallen heroes were also at the National Arcade to join in the celebration of their spouses. They are, however, worried about their welfare long after the death of their spouses. I would like the government, you know, to please provide a place for the widows, you know, so that each widow can have a, a house or a place to stay after leaving the barracks. And then to, like, give some of the widows you know, as much as possible, employment. Has always been from one problem, one issue, to the other. It has never been easy. Just the life of um, two people and just one person is playing the role. So it's been difficult all through. Only recently, some ex-military men were at the Ministry of Finance to lay their grievances. Though now feeble, they chanted songs reminding themselves of the good old days when they served their fatherland. Now, they want the government to pay their entitlement. We have here come here to protest non-payment of our minimum wage approved by the president. Over 20 months now, we have not been paid. Rest is sweet after labor is the popular slogan of the pensioners, but for the majority of these senior citizens who serve their fatherland with their strength, rest is not as sweet as it should be. 
Well, joining us here to discuss the Armed Forces Remembrance Day and the issues arising therefrom, we have a retired Army officer, Colonel Tony Yam. Thank you for joining us on the News at 10 tonight. Thank you very much. Now, I mean, a day like this, when our fallen heroes are remembered uh, for their sacrifice to our fatherland, um, for you, one who has served in that capacity, what are the memories that, that come to you on a day like this? Um, it's always a, a day, I, it's an interesting day in the sense that it's a day, w for I, when I was a, a, a young boy, my dad served in the Second World War, and since then, it's been a tradition to remember those who have uh, who lost their lives and those who served to defend what I will call our freedom. And um, I think it's the greatest day in, in that people who give their lives, who, are, who served to protect the people in every country of the world, are people who are special. And as such, um, they should be treated as such. And um, like the cry by some of the, those who lost their husbands um, needed, needs to be heard by government. I have three relations who died in the Northeast in the last three years. And um, their wives, after having stayed for some time in the barracks, are later left with no houses to go to. So I think it is important that the government makes the priority to provide accommodation for these widows in any place they, they want. And perhaps not just that, because they're also complaining of irregular pension um, and several other allowances. But, yeah. you know, many wonder um, why this is happening and, you know, what government can do. Um, I think the other thing also that I think those who, who may have loved, members of the fallen heroes, should, there should be a percentage or, um, of admissions into the Defense Academy or the Army to be reserved for these families of these fallen heroes. To start with, they are courageous people and, and the Army needs to maintain the tradition of courage. And where else can you get that group if not from families of fallen heroes? So in India and other places, most ex-soldiers' family are guaranteed. In Nigeria at the moment, the politician seems to have been displacing and favoring and leaving aside members of the armed forces who are willing to be soldiers and who can, in fact, be better soldiers than anybody. But isn't there no law that, that helps this, this cause? And there, there's, is, there's no law that guarantees um, giving a chance making a place. So maybe it's a high time there should, it should, be, there should be law made that the, there should be some percentages reserved for members of fallen heroes. And I think it's, it's really worth it because it is no joke sacrificing and dying for the country. And not the only way we can get back and encourage more people to, to do that is by taking care of their family. Absolutely. How much do you think Nigerians are... Um perhaps appreciating and supporting the armed forces? How better do you expect them to do this? Um, I, I think, first of all, the, the ordinary Nigerian is not as uh, informed about what it takes and the, the, die, the, lives, the loss of lives being experienced. It's only when it hits a member of your family, like I have had three members, that you really go through the, 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 the pain. Uh, the government, which should be, in charge, the president right now has done. He's been he's been good in trying to catch up for the welfare of retired men. But there are still some fences around the president that doesn't allow the president get to know about the plight of those who are still disadvantaged. So a lot of work needs to be done. Indeed. Well, I would like to thank you so much, retired army officer Colonel Tony. Um, thank you for joining us on the news at ten. Thank you.
We're staying with matters regarding the exploits of the military. Jakana Axis in Borno State is the latest location that has come under intensive airstrikes by the Air Task Force of Operation Lafayette And this is according to the Director of Defense Media Operations, Major General John Enedja, who states that several insurgents were killed in the operation. He says the airstrikes were carried out on January the 13th after intelligence reports revealed that the Boko Haram terrorists were conducting another logistics movement through the Jakana Maynok area of the state. Following the intelligence surveillance, the Nigerian Air Force helicopter gunships were scrambled to engage them. And on a sad note, no fewer than 14 persons, including five children, have lost their lives in a motor accident which occurred along Ayingba Ajokuta Road in Kogi State. Three vehicles, two trucks and a passenger bus were involved in the accident. Officials of the Federal Road Safety Commission said the vehicles were travelling on the same lane towards Ayingba when a truck suddenly hit the bus from behind. They explained that the bus was then trapped in between the two trucks for several hours with all the passengers in it before safety officials arrived at the scene. 14 out of the 23 persons involved in the accident died on the spot while nine others sustained various degree of injuries. When the news at 10 returns, Kaduna State Government rescues 160 Almagere from Benin Republic, Burkina Faso and 13 other states across the country. Please stay with us. And we take you to our Buja studios where Gloria Mezoke has some more stories. Good to see you, Gloria. Thank you, Millicent. Officials of the Kaduna State Government Task Force on Enforcing COVID-19 Related Regulations have rescued a 160 children from locations that are neither authorized and licensed as schools nor as children's homes. The chairman of the task force, Major Gariba Rumi, told Channels Television that 140 out of the children were rescued from Sheikh Dahiru Bochi Islamic School in Rigasa area on the outskirts of the state capital. The rescued children, according to him, are from 13 states in the north and south of Nigeria, while few others are from Benin Republic, Burkina Faso and Niger Republic. Since March 2020, 31,092 Almagere children have been repatriated to this state of origin following the Northern Governors Forum agreement to jointly end the abuses associated with the system. As a follow-up to that, the Kaduna State Government has undertaken a continuous exercise to identify locations where these children are being kept and taken steps to rescue them from such places and reunite them with their parents to continue their education. In all, 160 were rescued from some Islamic schools, with 140 of them from one operated by a prominent Islamic teacher. Some street beggars, including women and children, were not left out during the exercise. We started this operation 16 days ago. At the initial stage, we started with the hawkers, destitute, illegal uh, markets within our streets of Kaduna's, uh, Kaduna town, uh, environs, and then we now graduated to go into some of these uh, uh, Islamic schools. While canvassing for stiffer punishments for operators of such unapproved learning facilities, the children, according to Major Rimi, will be profiled, documented, and subjected to vigorous health checks. We are going to sort out also the 68 from Kaduna State. If they are indigenous of any local government, we'll take them to their various local government headquarters, hand over to the chairman, and then the chairman, as I told you earlier, will now compare them to their parents. 
This is not the first time the Kaduna state government will be evacuating Almagiri from the streets. With the latest exercise, the COVID-19 task force says bona fide citizens of the state will be relocated to their local governments of origin and handed over to council officials for documentation, registration, future enrollment into schools under the care of their parents or guidance. The National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, NAFDAQ, is raising the alarm over fake COVID-19 vaccines that are set to be currently in circulation. The Director General of NAFDAQ, Professor Mujisola Adeyeye, stated this at a virtual news conference in Abuja. According to the NAFDAQ boss, most of the fake vaccines being sold online are carrying the names of some of the vaccines that have been approved by the World Health Organization for emergency use. There have been reports of fake COVID vaccines. There are reports that there are fake COVID vaccines online, possibly in Nigeria. NAFDAQ is pleading with the public to beware. No COVID vaccines have been approved by NAFDAQ. Fake vaccines can cause COVID-like illnesses or other serious diseases that could kill. Those who fake medicines use the name of already approved medicines to fake their medicines. And the same thing with vaccine. That is why we have to be very, very diligent and at alert and to warn our public and people not to order any vaccine online, for any corporation not to order vaccine without going through NAFDA because there are so many fakers out there. The National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control has not received any application from COVID vaccine manufacturers yet. And therefore, no vaccines have been approved by NAFDA. COVID-19 vaccines are new and the side effects or adverse events must be well monitored. Therefore, if NAFDA does not approve, the public should not use. As the second wave of the coronavirus rages on, the Edo state government has decided to restrict movement as part of measures to curb the spread of the virus. Consequently, a new curfew starting from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. has been put in place. The state government also announced that school resumption cannot be earlier than February the 1st after due consultation with relevant stakeholders. Governor Godwin Obasaki also said the no mask, no entry rule is compulsory in all public places. As part of reducing the amount of movements around the city and around the state, we have decided to review our curfew period in Edo State. The curfew in Edo State will now start at 10 p.m and end at 5 a.m. from today. In places of worship, people must observe the social distancing. In the case of schools, we have decided in Edo State that schools will not reopen for now. This situation will be reviewed on by February 1st. Uh, we would like schools to reopen on February 1st, depending on the situation at that point in time. And over now to business news with Taniola Shibuali. Hey. 
Nike. So easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Gloria. Nigeria's headline inflation climbed higher by 0.86% to 15.75% in December 2020 from the 14.89% recorded in November. And that's according to data released today by the National Bureau of Statistics. The latest uptrend, which is the highest level in almost three years, was largely driven by forex rationing, output and productivity constraints, as well as higher logistics and distribution costs. At the same time, the NBS data shows that further increase in basic commodity prices pushed food index higher by 19.56%, while core inflation inched up by 0.32% to 11.37%. Urban inflation also rose by 16.33% year-on-year, while rural inflation rates stood at 15.20% last month. Leading African investment company has holding has acquired a 45% participating interest in Nigerian oil license OML-17 and related assets from the Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria Limited, Total Nigeria Limited and ENI. The transaction, which is one of the largest oil and gas financings in Africa in more than a decade has a financing component of $1.1 billion, which is provided by a consortium of global and regional banks and investors. A statement from the company says its subsidiary, TNOG Oil and Gas Limited, will be the sole operator of the asset. OML-17 has a current production capacity of 27,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day, an estimated 1.2 billion barrels reserves of oil equivalent, as well as an additional 1 billion barrels of oil equivalent resources of further exploration potential. Global Ratings Agency Moody says it expects that Nigeria's extremely low treasury bill yields and falling lending rates will limit net interest margins and profitability of its banks while reducing their ability to absorb loan losses. In a statement released today, Moody's explains that the country's very weak macro profile assessments reflect the continuously difficult operating environment faced by banks in the country. However, the ratings agency mentions that despite challenges in credit credit conditions, which relates to oil and gas exposure and foreign currency lending, the lendings are better placed to manage the risk compared to the previous oil price lump in 2015. Meanwhile, Moody says it expects that banks will protect their profitability by containing their operating costs, while asset quality volatility will remain a feature largely due to weaknesses in risk management, especially on loan concentrations. Well, Nigeria's stock market has sustained positive sentiments for a fifth consecutive day as the All Share Index crosses back into the 41,000 level, while 112 billion naira is added to the equities capitalization. Layo Adigoki tells us more. Thank you, Teniola, and welcome to the Stock Market Report. It has been a remarkable week for investors in the domestic stock market, and I say this because the positive sentiment which began on Monday was sustained into Friday's session. The losses recorded last week seem to have attracted a set of new investors into the equities market as they sustained their bargain hunting for high-value stocks and that pushed the market's benchmark index by 0.52% back into the 41,000 level. Now let's take a look at the sectoral performance table. You can see the green color was dominant across the five key sectors of listed equities, particularly the insurance sector, which has been posting the highest value in percent 
terms due to investors' interest on some of its key components. However, only the oil and gas sector closed in the red as a result of profit taken on Adova's shares. So far, the bull has firmly established its dominance at the NSC, which comes in line with traders' expectation. But with the latest increase in Nigeria's inflation and investors' focus on the first meeting of the CBN's Monetary Policy Committee next week, we keep our fingers crossed for the market's reaction for policy direction. That's it on the Stock Market Report. I'm Layo Adegoke. Thanks a lot, Lyle. On the other hand, it's mostly negative close for the most of the world's leading stock markets as concerns grow over new lockdown measures, economic recovery and a re-emergence of COVID-19 cases in China. Dented the positive sentiment from U.S. President-elect Joe Biden's $1.9 trillion stimulus plan. Well, here are the closing figures. <laughs> And that's business news tonight. It's back to Millicent for the rest of the news at 10. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thank you, Taniola. Uganda's opposition presidential candidate, Robert Kyagulanyi, popularly known as Bobby Wine, says the military has taken over his compound just hours after he alleged Thursday's election was rigged. The Electoral Commission says with 49.1% of ballots counted, President Yoweri Museveni has won 62.7% of the votes, compared to Bobby Wine with 29.3%. Final results are expected by Saturday afternoon. Let's head over to our London studios now, where Simon Fusi has more international news from around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Rescuers continue to search through the rubble of collapsed buildings after an earthquake struck the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia, killing at least 35 people. The 6.2 magnitude quake on Friday came just hours after an earlier smaller tremor. Hundreds of people were injured and thousands displaced by the quake. Eight people died in the collapse of a hospital while 60 were reportedly safely evacuated. Officials fear the death toll will increase as rescue efforts continue. Rescuers have been hampered by power cuts and a lack of phone signal, while local authorities warned that getting response teams to the area could be hampered by the coronavirus pandemic. Tremors were felt at around 1 a.m. local time for about seven seconds. No tsunami warning was issued, but thousands are reported to have left their homes, fleeing to safety. U.S. President-elect Joe Biden has unveiled a $1.9 trillion stimulus package for the struggling U.S. economy before he takes office next week. Tonight, I'll lay out my first step, the American Rescue Plan. If passed by Congress, it would include $1 trillion for households with direct payments of $1,400 to all Americans. Mr. Biden has promised to beat the pandemic that has killed more than 385,000 people in the U.S. The direct payments of $1,400 would come on top of $600 payments provided in a relief bill enacted last month. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has cast doubt on the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccination during his weekly address to the country. Brazil faces the world's second deadliest coronavirus outbreak after the United States. The country's death toll passed 200,000 this week. Right-wing President Jair Bolsonaro has been repeatedly criticized for downplaying the pandemic's gravity and undermining trust in vaccines. Mr. Bolsonaro has said he will refuse any COVID-19 vaccine himself. It comes as hospitals in Brazil's northern state of Arizona ran short of oxygen and made an urgent call for help to the United States. Amazonas, where nearly 6,000 people have died from COVID-19, is now suffering a devastating second wave that is pushing emergency services to breaking point. 
North Korea has unveiled a new type of submarine-launched ballistic missile, described by state media there as the world's most powerful weapon. Several of the missiles were displayed at a parade overseen by leader Kim Jong-un. The show of military strength comes days before the inauguration of Joe Biden as U.S. president. It also follows a rare political meeting where Mr. Kim described the U.S. as his country's biggest enemy. Images released by North Korean state media showed at least four large black and white missiles being driven past flag-waving crowds. Cameroon is getting ready to host the African Nations Championship, one of the first sports tournaments to be organized in Africa since the start of the global coronavirus pandemic. The tournament will be a full-scale test for Cameroon, ahead of the Africa Cup of Nations, to be held in January 2022. In late 2018, the Confederation of African Football decided to strip the right to stage the 2019 African Cup of Nations finals from Cameroon because of delays in its preparations and security concerns. It was supposed to host the tournament in January 2021, but it was postponed owned by one year because of COVID-19, which saw football suspended across most of the continent. And finally, a Thai restaurant in a hospital east of Bangkok is serving cannabis-infused dishes to try to destigmatize its usage and eventually draw in tourists. In December, Thailand delisted cannabis from the narcotics category, allowing those authorized by the government to cultivate the plant. The restaurant began serving the dishes in the beginning of January, becoming a popular dining spot for local visits. According to the chef, it is not very different to vegetables and it tastes like fried leaves. Customers describe the dishes as weird, but also delicious. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thanks, Simon. And for some sports news, here's Ayotunde Balogun. Many thanks, Millicent. The Golden Eagles of Nigeria have qualified for the African Under-17 Nations Cup after defeating the junior stallions of Burkina Faso 1-0 to reach the final of the West African Football Union Championships. Michael Emmanuel scored the winning goal in the 77th minute as the Golden Eagles edged past the Burkina Bays. The five-time world champions will face the junior elephants of Cote d'Ivoire in the final next week. Well, the Confederation of African Football CAF has announced that Morocco is host country for the 2022 Africa Women's Cup of Nations. Congo was initially built to stage the competition in 2020, but the Central African country pulled out in 2019. This left the Women's Championships without the substantive host before it was cancelled owing to the COVID-19 outbreak. Morocco will now stage the competition, which has been expanded from 8 to 12 teams for the first time. Former Manchester United and England forward Wayne Rooney has ended his illustrious playing career to take up the job of managing championship side Derby County on a full-time basis. Derby confirmed the 35-year-old has agreed a permanent deal until 2023, having succeeded Philip Koku on an interim basis in November last year. Rooney was in charge for nine matches as interim boss at Derby, winning three and drawing four. Rooney says he was blown away by Derby County's potential when he arrived at the club after a spell playing for DC United in the United States. FC Barcelona have announced that their presidential elections have been postponed after a rise in coronavirus cases prompted heavy restrictions in that region. The elections were set for January the 24th, but the Catalonian government informed the club that exceptions to the rules will not be made to allow people vote. The postponement means Barca will not have a new regime in charge for the last week of the January transfer window, while Lionel Messi's future is set to remain unresolved for a while longer. And Messi's contract expires at the end of June, when he could leave the club for free, having failed in an attempt to secure, to secure an exit last summer. And Tyson Fury's promoter Bob Arum claims a venue has been confirmed for a record-breaking all-British heavyweight clash with Anthony Joshua later this year. The fight, which could feature all four recognized heavyweight belts on the line, seems destined to head overseas amid the COVID-19 pandemic, with Saudi Arabia believed to be the front runner. Singapore, Dubai, Qatar and China are all believed to have shown an interest in staging the showdown, which could see both fighters earn upwards of $95 million each. And that's Sports News. I'm Ayo Tunde. He's back to you, Melissa. Thank you, Ayo Tunde.
The nation has today been remembering its fallen heroes and the Armed Forces Remembrance Day has marked the high point of the tribute to the brave military personnel. Our hearts reach out to all those who lost their loved ones as they remember this day. We pray their memories will continue to be a blessing to us as a nation. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Minister Antoine Walker. Have a good night.